Lesson 5 Noble Prince of Peace Sabbath Afternoon January 23 Christ is the Prince of Peace, Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, and it is His mission to restore to earth and heaven the peace that sin has broken. Being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, Romans chapter 5, verse 1. Whoever consents to renounce sin and open his heart to the love of Christ becomes a partaker of this heavenly peace. There is no other ground of peace than this. The grace of Christ received into the heart subdues enmity, it allays strife and fills the soul with love. He who is at peace with God and his fellow men cannot be made miserable. Envy will not be in his heart, evil surmisings will find no room there, hatred cannot exist. The heart that is in harmony with God is a partaker of the peace of heaven and will diffuse its blessed influence on all around. The spirit of peace will rest like dew upon hearts weary and troubled with worldly strife. Christ's followers are sent to the world with the message of peace. Whoever, by the quiet, unconscious influence of a holy life, shall reveal the love of Christ, whoever by word or deed shall lead another to renounce sin and yield his heart to God, is a peacemaker. Thoughts from the Mount of Blessing, pages 27 and 28. Words have been given me to speak to the people of God. Lift him up, the man of Calvary. Let humanity stand back, that all may behold him in whom their hopes of eternal life are centered. Says the prophet Isaiah, Unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Let the church and the world look upon their Redeemer. Let every voice proclaim with John, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Testimonies for the Church, Volume 5, page 729. Shortly before his crucifixion, Christ bequeathed to his disciples a legacy of peace. This peace is not the peace that comes through conformity with the world. It is an internal rather than an external peace. Without will be wars and fightings through the opposition of avowed enemies and the coldness and suspicion of those who claim to be friends. The peace of Christ is not to banish division, but it is to remain amid strife and division. The peace that Christ gave to his disciples and for which we pray is the peace that is born of truth, a peace that is not to be quenched because of division. Without may be wars and fightings, jealousies, envies, hatred, strife, but the peace of Christ is not that which the world giveth or taketh away. Our High Calling, page 328 Sunday, January 24 End of Gloom for Galilee The prophet was permitted to look down the centuries to the time of the advent of the promised Messiah. At first he beheld only trouble and darkness, dimness of anguish. Isaiah chapter 8, verse 22. Many who were longing for the light of truth were being led astray by false teachers into the bewildering mazes of philosophy and spiritism. Others were placing their trust in a form of godliness, but were not bringing true holiness into the life practice. The outlook seemed hopeless, but soon the scene changed, and before the eyes of the prophet was spread a wondrous vision. He saw the Son of Righteousness arise with healing in his wings, and lost in admiration, he exclaimed, The people that walked in darkness have seen a great light. They that dwell in the land of the shadow of death, upon them hath the light shined. Isaiah chapter 9 verse 2 The glorious light of the world was to bring salvation to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. Of the work before him, the prophet heard the Eternal Father declare, It is a light thing that thou shouldest be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the preserved of Israel. I will also give thee for a light to the Gentiles that thou mayest be my salvation unto the end of the earth. Isaiah chapter 49, verse 6. Prophets and Kings, page 373.
In every way possible, the enemy of truth and righteousness worked to cause the descendants of Abraham to forget their high and holy calling and to turn aside to the worship of false gods. And often his efforts were all but successful. For centuries preceding Christ's first advent, darkness covered the earth and gross darkness the people. Satan was throwing his hellish shadow athwart the pathway of men that he might prevent them from gaining a knowledge of God and of the future world. Multitudes were sitting in the shadow of death. Their only hope was for this gloom to be lifted, that God might be revealed. With prophetic vision, David, the anointed of God, had foreseen that the coming of Christ should be as the light of the morning when the sun riseth, even a morning without clouds. 2 Samuel chapter 23, verse 4. And Hosea testified, His going forth is prepared as the morning. Hosea chapter 6, verse 3. Quietly and gently, the daylight breaks upon the earth, dispelling the shadow of darkness and waking the earth to life. The multitudes dwelling in the land of the shadow of death were to see a great light. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 2. Prophets and Kings, pages 687 and 688. Christ came to heal the sick, to proclaim deliverance to the captives of Satan. He was in himself health and strength. He imparted his life to the sick, the afflicted, those possessed of demons. He turned away none who came to receive his healing power. He knew that those who petitioned him for help had brought disease upon themselves, yet he did not refuse to heal them. And when virtue from Christ entered into these poor souls, they were convicted of sin, and many were healed of their spiritual disease as well as of their physical maladies. The gospel still possesses the same power, and why should we not today witness the same results? Lift Him Up, page 258 Monday, January 25 a child for us. Mary did not understand Christ's mission. Simeon had prophesied of him as a light to lighten the Gentiles as well as a glory to Israel. Thus the angels had announced the Savior's birth as tidings of joy to all peoples. God was seeking to correct the narrow Jewish conception of the Messiah's work. He desired men to behold him not merely as the Deliverer of Israel, but as the Redeemer of the world. But many years must pass before even the Mother of Jesus would understand His mission. Mary looked forward to the Messiah's reign on David's throne, but she saw not the baptism of suffering by which it must be won. Through Simeon it is revealed that the Messiah is to have no unobstructed passage through the world. In the words to Mary, a sword shall pierce through thy own soul also. God, in His tender mercy, gives to the mother of Jesus an intimation of the anguish that already for His sake she had begun to bear. The Desire of Ages, page 56 Christ brought men and women power to overcome. He came to this world in human form to live a man amongst men. He assumed the liabilities of human nature to be proved and tried. In His humanity, He was a partaker of the divine nature. In His incarnation, He gained, in a new sense, the title of the Son of God. Said the angel to Mary, The power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. While the son of a human being, He became the Son of God in a new sense. Thus He stood in our world, the Son of God, yet allied by birth to the human race. From all eternity Christ was united with the Father, and when He took upon Himself human nature, He was still one with God. He is the link that unites God with humanity. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14 quoted. Ellen G. White comments in the SDA Bible Commentary, Volume 5, pages 1114 and 1115. The elder brother of our race is by the eternal throne. He looks upon every soul who is turning his face toward him as the Savior. He knows by experience what are the weaknesses of humanity, what are our wants, and where lies the strength of our temptations. For he was, in all points, tempted like as we are, yet without sin. 
Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15. He is watching over you, trembling child of God. Are you tempted? He will deliver. Are you weak? He will strengthen. Are you ignorant? He will enlighten. Are you wounded? He will heal. The Lord telleth the number of the stars, and yet he healeth the broken in heart, and bindeth up their wounds. Psalm 147, verses 4 and 3. The weaker and more helpless you know yourself to be, the stronger will you become in his strength. The heavier your burdens, the more blessed the rest in casting them upon your burden bearer. The Ministry of Healing, pages 71 and 72. Tuesday, January 26. The Rod of God's Anger. For all this they sinned still, and believed not for his wondrous works. When he slew them, then they sought him, and they returned and inquired early after God, and they remembered that God was their rock, and the high God their Redeemer. Psalm 78, verses 32 to 35. Yet the children of Israel did not turn to God with a sincere purpose. Though when afflicted by their enemies they sought help from him, who alone could deliver, yet their heart was not right with him, neither were they steadfast in his covenant. But he, being full of compassion, forgave their iniquity and destroyed them not. Yea, many a time turned he his anger away, for he remembered that they were but flesh, a wind that passeth away and cometh not again. Verses 37 to 39. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 410. The long-suffering of God is wonderful. Long does justice wait while mercy pleads with the sinner. But righteousness and judgment are the establishment of his throne. Psalm 97, verse 2, margin. The Lord is slow to anger, but he is great in power and will not at all acquit the wicked. The Lord hath his way in the whirlwind and in the storm, and the clouds are the dust of his feet. Nahum chapter 1, verse 3. The world has become bold in transgression of God's law. Because of his long forbearance, men have trampled upon his authority. They have strengthened one another in oppression and cruelty toward his heritage, saying, How doth God know? And is there knowledge in the Most High? Psalm 73, verse 11. But there is a line beyond which they cannot pass. The time is near when they will have reached the prescribed limit. Even now, they have almost exceeded the bounds of the long-suffering of God, the limits of His grace, the limits of His mercy. The Lord will interpose to vindicate His own honor, to deliver His people, and to repress the swellings of unrighteousness. Christ's Object Lessons, pages 177 and 178. Though no miraculous deliverance was granted John the Baptist, he was not forsaken. He had always the companionship of heavenly angels who opened to him the prophecies concerning Christ and the precious promises of Scripture. These were his stay, as they were to be the stay of God's people through the coming ages. To John the Baptist, as to those that came after him, was given the assurance, Lo, I am with you all the days, even unto the end. Matthew chapter 28, verse 20, Revised Version, Margin. God never leads His children otherwise than they would choose to be led if they could see the end from the beginning and discern the glory of the purpose which they are fulfilling as co-workers with Him. Not Enoch, who was translated to heaven, not Elijah, who ascended in a chariot of fire, was greater or more honored than John the Baptist, who perished alone in the dungeon. Unto you it is given in the behalf of Christ not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for his sake. Philippians chapter 1 verse 29. And of all the gifts that heaven can bestow upon men, fellowship with Christ in his sufferings is the most weighty trust and the highest honor. The Desire of Ages, pages 224 and 225. Wednesday, 
January 27. Root and branch in one. With awed yet exultant spirit, John the Baptist searched in the prophetic scrolls the revelations of the Messiah's coming, the promised seed that should bruise the serpent's head. Shiloh, the peace giver, who was to appear before a king, should cease to reign on David's throne. Now the time had come. A Roman ruler sat in the place upon Mount Zion. By the sure word of the Lord, already the Christ was born. Isaiah's rapt portrayals of the Messiah's glory were his study by day and by night, the branch from the root of Jesse, a king to reign in righteousness, judging with equity for the meek of the earth. Isaiah chapter 11 verse 4. The heart of the lonely exile was filled with the glorious vision. He looked upon the king in his beauty and self was forgotten. He beheld the majesty of holiness and felt himself to be inefficient and unworthy. He was ready to go forth as heaven's messenger, unawed by the human, because he had looked upon the divine. He could stand erect and fearless in the presence of earthly monarchs because he had bowed low before the king of kings. The Desire of Ages, page 103. The Savior longs to manifest his grace and stamp his character on the whole world. It is his purchased possession, and he desires to make men free and pure and holy. Though Satan works to hinder this purpose, yet through the blood shed for the world, there are triumphs to be achieved that will bring glory to God and the Lamb. Christ will not be satisfied till the victory is complete, and he shall see of the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. Isaiah chapter 53 verse 11. All the nations of the earth shall hear the gospel of his grace. Not all will receive his grace, but a seed shall serve him. It shall be accounted to the Lord for a generation. Psalm 22 verse 30. The Desire of Ages, pages 827 and 828. The gospel message proclaimed by Christ's disciples was the announcement of his first advent to the world. It bore to men the good tidings of salvation through faith in him. It pointed forward to his second coming in glory to redeem his people, and it set before men the hope, through faith and obedience, of sharing the inheritance of the saints in light. This message is given to men today, and at this time there is coupled with it the announcement of Christ's second coming as at hand. The signs which he himself gave of his coming have been fulfilled, and by the teaching of God's word we may know that the Lord is at the door. John in the Revelation foretells the proclamation of the gospel message just before Christ's second coming. He beholds an angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, and to every nation, and kindred, and tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment is come. Revelation chapter 14, verses 6 and 7. Christ's Object Lessons, pages 226 and 227. Thursday, January 28. You comforted me. Through all our trials, we have a never failing helper. He does not leave us alone to struggle with temptation, to battle with evil, and be finally crushed with burdens and sorrow. Though now he is hidden from mortal sight, the ear of faith can hear his voice saying, Fear not, I am with you. I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Revelation chapter 1, verse 18. I have endured your sorrows, experienced your struggles, encountered your temptations. I know your tears. I also have wept. The griefs that lie too deep to be breathed into any human ear, I know. Think not that you are desolate and forsaken. Though your pain touch no responsive cord in any heart on earth, look unto me and live. The mountains shall depart, and the hills be removed, but my kindness shall not depart from thee, neither shall the covenant of my peace be removed, saith the Lord that hath mercy on thee. Isaiah chapter 54, verse 10. The Desire of Ages, page 483. Jesus is the substance 
the glory and fragrance, the very life itself. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. John chapter 8, verse 12. Then the royal path cast up the ransom to walk in is not discouraging darkness. Our pilgrimage would indeed be lonely and painful were it not for Jesus. I will not, he says, leave you comfortless. John chapter 14, verse 18. Then let us gather every registered promise. Let us repeat them by day and meditate upon them in the night season and be happy. And in that day thou shalt say, O Lord, I will praise thee. Though thou wast angry with me, thine anger is turned away, and thou comfortest me. Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. For the Lord Jehovah is my strength and my song. He also has become my salvation. Therefore with joy shall ye draw water out of the wells of salvation. And in that day shall ye say, Praise the Lord, call upon his name, declare his doings among the people, make mention that his name is exalted, sing unto the Lord, for he hath done excellent things. This is known in all the earth. Cry out and shout, thou inhabitant of Zion, for great is the Holy One of Israel in the midst of thee. Isaiah chapter 12, verses 1 to 6. Is not this indeed a royal path we are traveling, cast up for the ransomed of the Lord to walk in? Can there be provided a better path, a safer way? No, no. Then let us practice the instruction given. Let us see our Savior as our refuge, as our shield on our right hand to defend us from the arrows of Satan. Selected Messages, Book 2, page 244. For further reading, the Upward Look, Our Competent Savior, page 39, and That I May Know Him, Why the Lord Delays, page 349.